Basic analysis of the Apollo landing sites using Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter NAC imaging. And I will remain for questions. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
of the disturbed area. Um, and also a key thing we noted um, in making these phase ratio images, that if you take um, the ratio between an image with a more backward viewing geometry to um, that of a more forward viewing geometry, the blast zone again appears darker. And this indicates that uh, the blast zone is actually less backscattering. And we have attributed this possibly due to the destruction of this very castle structure. So here um, are the results of measuring the spatial extent of the blast zones. Here uh, in the first half, I've got the Apollo landing sites, as well as their east-west diameter, north-south diameter, and their elliptical area. Uh, the diameters range from about 130 to 280 meters, um, with Apollo 12 being the largest because we include Surveyor Crater in the measurements. We, um, when they descended, they hovered next to the crater. We think that it acted as a mechanism to contain the rocket exhaust and therefore enlarge the, the blast zone. Um, and then at the bottom here, we've got the averages for Apollo, Luna, and Surveyor. And here just you can see that the average Apollo blast zone is over 100 times larger than the average Luna blast zone and over, uh, sorry, over 10 times larger than the Luna blast zones and over 100 times larger than Surveyor. This is just due to the lander mass and thrust. Uh, so in order to take more um, quantitative measurements of uh, the reflectance variations, we take profiles across the landing site. So here's Apollo 11, again, blast zone outline, just a horizontal profile. Um, and then we plot up the I over F, the reflectance, uh, versus just, just distance across. Um, and higher I over Fs are going to be um, more reflective areas. And here this is a bit noisy. We get some effects from the lunar module as well as its shadow, as well as things such as um, craters. Uh, so instead of using this method, I actually um, draw kind of more carefully drawn profiles across the site in order to try to avoid things such as small craters and also hit this area right beside the lunar module. And again, plotting the same thing, it's a little bit easier to see now. Um, just for reference, the lunar module is somewhere right in here. You can see that um, there's a distinct increase in reflectance within the blast zone. It tapers off gradually as you get farther away from the lander. We also see this dip right beside the lunar module due to the astronaut's boot prints actually roughing up the surface. Um, and again, sometimes you do, do hit some craters. It's kind of hard to avoid them on the moon. But using this method, we take the average IRF values for the blast zone and the background for some more of our measurements. Um, here are just some results. I know this is a little bit busy, but I want to mostly draw your attention to the last column. So here I've got the missions, Apollo, Luna, and Surveyor, as well as the average IRF for the blast zone, average IRF for the black background, and then the normalized IRF, which is the blast zone divided by the background. Here you can see that the average normalized IRF is above one for each of the sites just indicating that the blast zone is more reflective than the background. Um, and here I've listed the average values for Apollo, Luna, and Surveyor. And you can see that they're all fairly identical within error, regardless of the differences in lander mass. And all of these values are reported for a phase angle of 30 degrees for consistency. Um, and again, the average I, over, average I over F values are between 2 and 16% higher within the blast zone than outside. Uh, so actually plotting some of this up now, here I've got plotted um, the reduced reflectance, which is I over F divided the, by the lone LC logger function given down below, which is just um, takes into account the incidence and the emission angles. Um, plotting it this way just kind of masks the effects of viewing geometry. Uh, so reduced reflectance versus uh, phase angle. And here we see a common trend for planetary surfaces that as your phase angle increases, your uh, reflectance decreases. Uh, we also see um, the effects of composition in this plot. Up here, uh, the blue squares are Apollo 16. Blue circles are Luna 20, and these uh, kind of purple triangles are Surveyor 7. Um, these were all of the sites that landed in the highlands, or all the missions that landed in the highlands. Um, and then down below are the ones that are in the mare. So again, the highlands are more feldspathic, just naturally more reflective, so it makes sense that they plot above the others. Uh, so now plotting the normalized um, I over F, so the blast zone divided by the background, again, versus phase angle. Uh, we see this is just for the Apollo landing sites. We see that as phase angle increases, um, the normalized reflectance increases. We actually get a larger separation at higher phase angles between the reflectance in the blast zone and the background. Um, and we think that this may be due to effects of roughness. So if the blast zone is smoother than the background, at higher phase angles, the background is going to have much larger shadows than the blast zone, and therefore you're going to have a, a much higher normalized eye over uh, And when we put in the Luna and Surveyor sites, we see that they do follow the same trends, but there's always that one rebellious child who can't follow the rules. Uh, so down here is Surveyor 7 kind of doing the opposite thing. We think this may do just, be due just to the, the unique landing site. It was on the, the ejected blanket of Tycho. Um, still kind of investigating that a little bit further. But. Okay, so now taking into account the effects of viewing geometry here, I've got just I over F plotted versus incidence angle. 
And here we actually see that kind of at lower incidence angles, we're starting to see the effects of viewing geometry. So these points up here are for a backward viewing geometry. Um, and these are for forward. They kind of start to merge down here. We're not really getting a good trend um, for easy uh, analysis. So also plotting, same thing, IRF versus phase angle now. Still see that kind of a little bit of scatter in here, not really following the smooth curve. But if we instead plot the reduced reflectance, so low mill CO2 function um, taken into account here, we can actually kind of mask the effects of these viewing geometries. If I just flip back and forth, so you get a much smoother curve this way. And also looking at this plot, we see, again, these higher phase angles, but much larger separation between the blast zone and the background than we do with the smaller phase angles. Again, we think possibly due to some kind of smoothing of the surface. And just kind of in summary, uh, again, um, we see that at each of the Apollo, Luna, and Surveyor landing sites, we do see that the blast zones are more reflective in this background area, indicating there has been some kind of disturbance occurring. Uh, that we do get a greater separation as phase angle and incidence angle increase. Again, we've attributed this possibly due to smoothing. Um, it's also very consistent with uh, an increase in the forward scattering nature um, uh, within the blast zones. Uh, again, we see these in the phase ratio images of the blast zones are more forward scattering, or if you like to think of it in terms of backscattering, it's less backscattering than the uh, dis undisturbed regions. Um, the Apollo, Luna, and Surveyor sites all show the same effects. Um, they have different sizes due to differences in lander mass, but they show the same reflectance variations. Um, and kind of our leading conclusions that we're kind of looking at right now are that this is due to destruction of the fairy castle structure, so reduction in backscattering and light characteristics, um, and or smoothing of the surface. I'm still going to do a little bit more work to try to verify this for sure. Thank you. I think that um, the fact that you've blown all this dust away when you landed, particularly you, you were going back to Apollo 12, mm -hmm. and the fact that you have Surveyor 3 about 185 meters away that got sandblasted to hell. That means that those particles are really flying, and I'm surprised that you only find the effects out to about 200 meters or mm -hmm. so. I would think it would be much greater. Um, second of all, I think that most of the lunar surface at the very top is a mature soil. Mm -hmm. And I think once you disturb that by any means, you're going to get a um, less mature soil. And I think it has a lot to do with just blowing that. Yeah. Blowing um, so we did out. actually look at um, some soil samples that were taken by the Apollo astronauts and tried to compare the ones that were within the blast zone to those without to see if we did see this uh, change in maturity. Um, but if you actually look at core samples, these were all taken outside the blast zone. Um, it's a little bit, little bit small. But here you can see um, maturity versus depth. Your maturity doesn't change significantly until you get to about 20 centimeters below the regolith. So um, we don't really think that that much soil was actually blown away during the landings. Um, so we, that's kind of why we, we weren't really leaning towards that hypothesis quite as much. It's just that we think you know only the first few centimeters were blown away, um, which really isn't a significant. You don't even move from mature to submature layer until you get to 20 centimeters, which is kind yeah, of why I, we. I think you're putting a little, little bit more faith into the core samples than they, they deserve. Yeah. We really just need the astronauts to go back and take some very thin surface samples. but. Um, with regard to your results here, uh, could you then predict, if, if you know the lander mass, how far outside or away from the lander mass would you need to go to get uh, material that would be uncontaminated from the, from the landing mass engines? I think you could probably make some predictions. Um, I mean, simulations show these particles fly very far. So I don't really know if you, know, you can go a certain distance and say these aren't affected by the rocket exhaust at all. But if you just look at the size of the blast zones, you could at least think, OK, we can go this far away to have something that wasn't necessarily disturbed during the landing. I, I'm just thinking if you were going to do, say, oh, I don't know, an SPA sample return, mm -hmm. how far away from the lander would you need to be in order to get material that was uncontaminated yeah, by that yeah. exhaust? I'm, I'm sure I haven't done the calculations, but I think if you look at yeah, the lander mass and the sizes, it's actually kind of on my to-do list just to figure out. You can figure out something like that. So, yeah. 